This is JCT TV, Bible study for the 21st century. Welcome friends, always great to have you with us. And I love doing this. I hope you love it as much as I do. <laughs> if you do, then we're in good shape. Uh, we are now in Luke, the, uh, the Gospel of Luke in the um, 22nd chapter. And we're into something I'm really gonna take my time with because it's all about the arrest, the, the trial, the crucifixion, the resurrection, uh, and the ascension of Jesus. It's just really the heart of the Gospel of Luke. And we're gonna get at it right after this break. Don't go away. and to take care of the widow and the orphan in their time of need. And that is exactly what we do. Lives are changing. Why? Because Jesus is Lord. And why? Because Christians have come together as a body. The united body of Christ is coming and saying, it stops with this generation. We break it and we move on. The kind of religion that God endorses is to care for orphans and widows in their distress, justice, and to keep oneself unpolluted from the world, righteousness. So friends, I want to uh, read a fairly extensive passage here just because it's uh, a narrative that shouldn't be cut up. Although I'm going to stop after the first sentence for a moment. It's verses 39 to 65 where Jesus is betrayed. Uh, he's arrested, he's mocked, and um, he's you know about to uh, find his way to the cross. But let's, let's start with verse 39 of chapter 22 of Luke. Coming out, he went to the, coming out, of the Mount of Olives, or the, I'm sorry, out of the upper room. Uh, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed and his disciples also followed him. Now, let, let me just stop there for a minute. Uh, as most of you know, um, back in 1981, the Israeli government invited me to plant a church in Jerusalem. Uh, we had just built a brand new church. We had about 800 people attending in, in North Toronto, Canada. Uh, my wife and I had three little kids, um, aged uh, seven, five, and three. But it was an offer I couldn't refuse. And so in 1981, we resigned our church in Toronto and um, moved to Israel. It was a huge culture shock. Um, it was uh, massive, really, because we, we really went like new immigrants. And when I see some of the immigrant issues that you know seem to be coming more and more our way here in the West. I'm fully uh, sympathetic with those who are shifting from a home culture, a known culture, to a foreign culture. It's it's a huge, huge uh, adjustment. Anyhow, we lived there for seven years, and we planted King of Kings Church. You can Google King of Kings Jerusalem and see what what it's up to these days. But um, we we had to make adjustments on every level. But one of the things we did. Uh, very, very early into our stay there, once we finally found uh, a flat to rent and, uh, you know, we were sort of semi-settled, 
we started walking Jerusalem with our little kids. Um, we uh, couldn't get enough of it. You know, the, the old city of Jerusalem is only a square kilometer, so it's, you know, it's very, very small. Um, but it, at the same time, is just absolutely um, multidimensional when it comes to its history. But one of the things that uh, was most interesting to me was whenever we would go to the eastern uh, extremity of the old city, the, the, the eastern wall, looking down into the Kidron Valley and across the valley to the Mount of Olives. I, you know, I was so attuned to the Mount of Olives because so much of the gospel story revolves around that location. It's a very dramatic thing to see. Uh, I didn't realize how steep the, the banks are down to the bottom of the Kidron Valley and then up to the Mount of Olives. But back in Jesus' time, it was even deeper than it is now. Uh, we don't know exactly how many, you know, feet of elevation was added to the bottom of the Kidron Valley when the Romans raised the city and knocked all those stones down into the valley. But over time, you know, earth built up and vegetation and so on. And so you've got uh, the bottom of the valley, but it's not close to where it used to be. Nevertheless, it's a very steep valley. And <clears throat> you stand there uh, by the eastern gate of the old city and you look across down and up, and there's the Mount of Olives right there. Now there's buildings, of course. The Intercontinental Hotel is up there in the horizon. Uh, the Church of the Ascension is up there in the horizon. Uh, there's several things there, but nevertheless, the, the thing that kind of focuses your, your, uh, your mind is the Garden of Gethsemane, which is about a third of the way up uh, the Mount of Olives. So you go down in the Kenan Valley, and then you climb up a bit, and there it is, the Garden of Gethsemane. And uh, it's still very much a garden. It's an olive garden. It's full of beautiful olive trees, and there's uh, the Church of All Nations. It's been built there many years ago uh, in honor of um, uh, Jesus suffering there uh, before he was arrested in the uh, favorite spot of his ministry, which was the Garden of Gethsemane. But it's just a beautiful place to visit. And what's kind of amazing about it is that um, uh, some of the old trees there, some of the trees that are yeah. so massive, you, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't get your arms around them. Uh, and as is the case with olive trees, the inner core seems to be eaten out. And yet you've got this solid kind of, you can't call it bark, it's just kind of an exterior 8, 10, 12 inches around the, the core that's been eaten out, still surrounding the, the, you know, the circumference of the tree. And it's producing olives, producing olives in abundance. But the one tree there that is the oldest, when Jesus was in the garden, maybe it was just a, a sapling. We, you know, we don't know. Um, I can understand why it was a favorite spot for Jesus because it became a favorite spot for me. Um, I got to know the uh, gardener uh, and the garden keeper, uh, the keeper of the gate of the keys, and um, across the alleyway from the church and the main feature of the Garden of Gethsemane, there's a locked gate. And with his help, I'd, you know, he'd open it for me and I'd go in all by myself to a, another area, maybe twice the size of what most tourists see, without any buildings, without any embellishment. It's just garden and olive trees and totally uh, alone. Uh, many times I went in there by myself. Sometimes I would take in, you know, friends who were visiting from overseas and invariably what would happen is I'd say, look, let's go in there and let's take an hour and just find a tree somewhere, sit in the shade and just talk to the Lord. Uh, invariably, you know, the tears would flow. It's such a special place. So I, I'm telling you all this to say this, that when you, sometimes when you read, you know, a sentence like this, he went out to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed and his disciples followed him. You, you have to kind of step back and get the mental picture. And I have the advantage of, you know, having lived there for seven years and having frequented, you know, the Garden of Gethsemane so many times, uh, but I, I can never get over it. Every time I'm in Jerusalem, I, I always go there uh, because it's one of my most favorite spots in the whole world. And it certainly was for Jesus. Okay, verse 40. When he came to the place, he said to them, to his disciples, pray that you may not enter into temptation. <clears throat> and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it's your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. 
When he rose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. Then he said to them, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. And while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude. And he who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When those around him saw what was going to happen, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus answered and said, Permit even this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, captains of the temple, and elders who had come to him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you daily in the temple, you didn't try to seize me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. Having arrested them, him, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed at a distance. Now, when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, This man was also with him. He denied him. He denied, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And after a little while, another saw him and said, You also are of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And then about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, Surely this fellow also is with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you're saying. Immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. Now the men who held Jesus mocked him, beat him, and having blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is the one who struck you? And many other things they blasphemously spoke against him. Okay, let me go back to the beginning at verse 40. Um, here you have Jesus about to be betrayed by his own. Arrested by thugs, mocked by the high priest guards, and yet instead of acting defensively or lashing out or being um, terse, uh, Jesus resolutely practices what he had prayed, Father, not my will, but thy, th yours be done. And he allows the drama to unfold. And it is a drama. And you need to know, friends, that this story is just as much of a drama today as it was the first time it was read. And you and I, who are believers, are a part of that drama, believe it or not. We're going to take a break. We'll come back and carry on with it right after this. As I said a moment ago, this story is a drama for sure. Uh, and, and the drama unfolds quickly. Uh, you got Jesus at prayer. You have the disciples asleep and why wouldn't they be asleep? They've been up all night. 
You had a crowd of ruffians with Judas at the head, a swinging sword, a near miss. <laughs> Believe me, that sword was intended to cut off the guy's head. Um, a severed ear, um, a healing, pushing and pulling Jesus down through the Kidron Valley and up to the house of the high priest. Uh, Peter's fear of arrest and his denial of Jesus, mockery, beating, insult. It's gripping reading for sure. But two powerful things stand out as I read this text, at least for me. Something else may stand out for you. But one is something that Jesus said. The other is something that he did. To the arresting officers of the temple guard, as Luke describes them, he said, this is your hour when darkness reigns. This is your hour when darkness reigns, verse 53. And to Peter, his message was nonverbal. He turned and looked straight at Peter. That's a little later on in, you know, when Je uh, Jesus is being brought before the, uh, the officials and the fire is out in the courtyard and Peter's sitting there trying to be anonymous, denying Jesus and obviously doing it within earshot of Jesus himself. He turns and looks straight at Peter. And I'll get back to that. So <clears throat> the betrayal, uh, the arrest, the mockery of Jesus all took place under the cover of darkness. Uh, the Apostle John in his gospel, when he writes um, uh, his record, uh, he, 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 desc he describes a, a conversation Jesus had with one of the Sanhedrin members, Nicodemus, remember in John chapter 3, who came to see Jesus by night? Um, and John records Jesus saying to Nicodemus, and this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Well, it's interesting, you know, the kind of the juxtaposition of, of, of the two. Because when Jesus says to the guards in the garden, you know, this is your hour when darkness reigns, he's taken down to the Kedron and up to Caiaphas' house in the darkness. Um, the, the principal figures, including Jesus and Peter, you know, are standing there in the darkness with the faces lit with a flickering light from a, from a bonfire. I mean, it's, it's all happening uh, in, in the dark. Uh, so Luke doesn't name any of the uh, Council of Elders in verse 66. I think you can read Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin, depending on what source you're reading, could be 70 or 71 um, elders, essentially, who were the, um, uh, they were like the Supreme Court in Jerusalem. They, they, they had the final say in terms of civil governance under the Romans. The Romans, if you will, down, downloaded the, you know, the actual day-to-day -day management of the city to the actual citizens themselves. But the Sanhedrin were generally fairly wealthy, and they were well-established, uh, proven, you know, men of faith, uh, and, and they would sit in judgment when necessary over cases that required uh, their, their input. Okay, so you can call them Council of Elders, call them the Sanhedrin, what you will, but you can be sure that not all of them, all of them were there because uh, this was Passover after all. And Passover is like a, uh, you know, a super Shabbat. Yeah, you, don't, you don't mess with Passover in terms of labor, in terms of walking too far, in terms of carrying things, in terms of doing anything other than uh, worship. So it's very unlikely that Nicodemus was there, although we do see him playing a prominent role in Jesus' burial after his crucifixion. And John describes that in John chapter 19. But the point is, men love to do their evil deeds in the dark. You know, we, we forget that light has come into the world and nothing is hidden from the Lord. I, I think of um, one of my favorite reads, C.S. Lewis's Narnia Chronicles, which is a series of books that was written for children but it certainly appeals to the child in me, and I've read the whole series several times. But it, it's a classic, uh, and if you haven't read the Narnia Chronicles, it'd be something that you might want to pick up somewhere and read. Um, but in The Last Battle, which is the final book of the series, one of the closing scenes has the disgruntled, disbelieving dwarfs uh, insisting on staying in the darkness of the false prophet's shed while the light of Narnia and the freedom it brings is just on the other side of the door. All they have to do is go through the door. But the dwarfs is for the dwarfs, they grumble. The dwarfs is for the dwarfs. Leave us alone. We prefer the dark. We don't want the light. You know, I don't want to preach here, but I think one of the key reasons why so many 
uh, of us resist not only committing to believe in, in God, but resist the very notion is because to do so, we know intuitively brings with it accountability. We don't want to be accountable. We don't want to have, we don't want to have some kind of a, you know, a heavenly um, a babysitter. And that's how God is seen by many people. So, you know, it's kind of a, uh, a hyper parent who, you know, is uh, controlling and um, micromanaging your life. Well, of course, that's not the God of the Bible at all, but that's, that's how they see him. That's how perhaps he's been presented to them uh, when they were younger. Who knows? But the point is they don't want to be accountable. And I understand that. Accountability ha brings a certain stress to one's life. We don't like to be accountable to the government. We don't like to give our income taxes. We don't like to uh, have our books, you know, um, explored by some uh, agency who wants to make sure that we're uh, doing what we say we're doing with our money, our income, and our outflow. Uh, we don't even like to be accountable to our neighbors. You know, go away from me. Why? You know, leave me alone. Uh, th this is sort of human nature, and that's why, you know, it's it resonates when. The scripture says that men prefer darkness rather than light. It's not just a case of the physical darkness. It's a case of the of keeping, if you will, prying eyes, uh, as we see it, out of our life. Okay? That's so true. As for Peter in this story, I think we can relate. Um, all of us can remember a moment when we were, as they say, found out. Um, you know, that parent, that teacher, um, that loved sibling, perhaps a friend, uh, said nothing when we were found out, but looked at us with eyes full of disappointment and hurt. Now, my wife tells me that when she was a little girl, all her father had to do was look at her in a certain disapproving way, and she would melt. And he was such a loving guy, never laid a hand on her, but just the look <laughs> was enough uh, for her to realize that she'd been caught in some, you know, bad behavior. It, it, you know, it, it can be crushing. Uh, and it certainly crushed Peter. Uh, he, he went outside and wept bitterly, we've just read. And, 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 and Luke said, you, you, you say you don't know me, but I know you. That's what Jesus Luke said. I know you. In a sense, you might say that Jesus looked right into the darkness. Here's that darkness theme again. The darkness of Peter's soul. Peter was anything but perfect, and that's why you and I can relate to him, because we're not perfect either. Uh, you know, so what else to do when that look came right into his soul, but to rush outside of the compound and weep? That's exactly what he did, which of course is one of the most endearing aspects of Peter's personality. Uh, King David also, he knew how to repent. Uh, to confess and to repent. Now, to confess is the emotional moment. Repentance is the volitional moment. Confession says, I did it. Repentance says, I'll never do it again. So with confession, you own up. With repentance, you turn around and walk in the opposite direction from that bad behavior. That's the difference between the two. A lot of people confess, 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 sometimes with tears and great drama. They never repent. And so what happens in that case, if you're married to someone like that, you end up in a kind of a uh, codependency, which is a very unhealthy, dysfunctional state of affairs, right? Anyway, Peter's shame, his profound shame, led to repentance. For later in the story, he fulfilled Jesus' prophetic insight. When you have turned back, read repentance, strengthen your brothers. He said that back in the upper room in verse 32. So he not only repented, but Peter stood tall on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, as he preached the powerful first sermon of the early church. You know, the Bible says, those who are forgiven much love much. And I think that is definitely playing out here in Peter's life. You, you can be sure that moment when Jesus looked into his soul was not just soul crushing, it would be enough to just kill you, you know, spiritually. But he rebounded, but every time he preached the name of Christ, I'm sure he remembered his moment of denial. In Africa, even the most basic medical aid is often non-existent. It is a continent that has been ravaged by disease. 
malaria, tuberculosis, HIV and AIDS are unrelenting. Every man, woman and child suffers from a lack of adequate health care. Even treatable illnesses like diarrhea and upper respiratory infections can prove deadly. Clinics are too few and often beyond the reach of those in rural areas. Wow, working for orphans and widows is equipping mobile medical clinics with knowledge and tools to reach out to the sick. Trained nurses are treating the ill. Communities are being educated on hygiene and disease prevention. Voluntary counseling and testing for HIV and AIDS is also offered through the clinic. Fear of stigma and discrimination keeps many from being tested for HIV. Nurses address this issue. They work to provide emotional and medical support for those who test positive for the virus. Communities are being transformed through education and medical treatment brought by mobile clinics. Knowledge about disease transmission is changing behaviors and preventing many illnesses. Basic health care prevents needless deaths. Voluntary counseling and testing has also curbed the spread of AIDS. Many people have learned a lot about <coughs> HIV AIDS. Since we are taught, we are trained as community health workers, we have the knowledge, we give it to them, even through role plays and everything, even by talking to them as we go in the villages. So now people are aware what HIV AIDS is, how it can be prevented, how it can be infected and all that. By supporting WOWS, Working for Orphans and Widows mobile medical clinics, you can bring hope to countless communities. You can save a life. So friends, when we talk about confession and repentance, we're talking about something that all of us need to consider. None of us likes to admit that we're sinners. None of us likes to say, my bad. And none of us in our heart of hearts really wants to be accountable to anybody. But the fact of the matter is we are. Because God is and because our neighbor is right next door, we are accountable to both accountable to our maker and accountable to our neighbor. That's why Jesus calls us to love God and love neighbor. And to love God and love neighbor means to own up to one's shortcomings, own up to one's need of forgiveness, to confess our need, to enter into the grace and the salvation that God provides freely through Christ, and then to walk the path of repentance until the day we die. Thanks for watching. See you next time.